We are overwhelmed. Praise God. Our loving and gracious Father, we thank you this morning. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. <clears throat> Father, we come before your throne of grace on the first Sunday of May to 2020. And we ask, Lord, that you be in our presence as we come to praise, to worship for God, and to teach your word. <laughs> Father, we thank you again for the gift of life. We thank you, Lord, for preservation of life. I pray, my Lord and my God, that as I deliver your word, give me utterance and give your saints understanding. Amen. Father, I give you all the praise and I give you all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. amen. And amen. Good morning, Man Zion Fellowship Church. Here in the USA, in Ghana, and in Sierra Leone. And we've been studying the book of Revelation. And uh, we are in the second chapter of the book of Revelation. Praise God. Amen. But what I want us to do this morning is to go back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. Revelation 1.19, our text today for um, the theme, the theme is the church of Ephesus, and our text is uh, Revelation 2.1-7, to but I just want us to backtrack this morning and look at Revelation 1.19, because the word of God says in Revelation 1.19, he says, John was told, write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. So really, this is how the book of Revelation is divinely divided. Okay, it's broken down in three areas. Because when we look at that verse, it says, it says the things which are seen. What that refers to really is that it is the vision that John had of a glorified Jesus Christ. And so the whole of chapter 1, if you like, is an outline of, of, of what John saw, the vision that John saw of the glorified Jesus Christ. And it also says, it says, the things which are, what is it referring to? It's referring to the churches, which the book addresses. And which we're going to start with already seven churches, and we're going to start with the church of, of, uh, at Ephesus today. We're going to address that. And then it says, it says, the things which will take place after this. So we're talking about, the, the second aspect actually is talking about the church age. And from chapter 2 to the end of chapter 3, Jesus is going to talk about the church. And then from chapter 4 onwards to chapter 22, it's going to talk about the things that will take place. So really, if you like, it's more of an outline that, you know, verse Chapter 1, verse 19 has given us of the whole book of Revelation. So as I said, it's divided into three divine sections. Amen? Amen. And again, this letter actually that John wrote to, you know, that John wrote to the seven churches, you know, are for every church is really. I know this was written centuries ago, but again, it applies to us today. And that's why the Bible says in um, verse 7 of Revelation 2, he says, those who have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. So what was Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying that we should open our spiritual ear. Amen? Open your spiritual ear and ready to listen to what he has to say about his church. Because his church in Ephesus was doing a lot of things. They were doing many things right. You know, but, it, but the Bible says that it had a fatal flaw. So Jesus was you know, coming second in this church. It wasn't taking first place anymore in the church. And for those of us who are sporting people who like to watch sports, we all know that nobody really cares much about who comes second in a race or in a sporting activity. It's always who wins, who the winner is. And because everybody's focused on becoming number one, because there's only one number, and that's number one, everybody is focused on winning. It doesn't matter how the game is played anymore. It's just focused on winning. Amen? And... and, and so, what I want to say here is that, that that's not how it should be in the kingdom of God, okay? In the kingdom of God, really, number one matters as well. It matters. It matters in a way that, you know, Jesus even said in the book of Matthew 6, 33, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things will be added unto you. So, in the kingdom of God, number one is important, Amen. Right? 
because it will determine who comes first in your life as a believer. So if God comes life comes first in your life, then that is number one in your life. Amen? Amen. So we don't have to really do things that are unconventional to be number one. All we need to do is to put Christ, to put Jesus Christ as number one in our life. But before I begin this morning, I just want to ask a question. Mount Zion, we as a church, where does Jesus come? In what position do we put Jesus? Is Jesus number one? And again, on an individual level, is Jesus number one in your life? What, what, what is more important to you? You know, Pastor Pa just, you know, gave us a great exhortation on, on, on fighting and giving. What is more important to you? Buying a new television or paying your tithe to the Lord? Watching TV on a Sunday morning or coming to church on Sunday to serve God or coming to Bible study on Wednesdays? So what are your priorities? Where do you put Jesus Christ in your life? Because these are the things that will determine whether Jesus comes first or whether Jesus comes second in your life. Amen? So we have to, you know, the priority is our responsibility. Amen? But now, before we come down too hard on this church in Ephesus, I just want us to see that there were so many things that this church did right. They did a lot of things that were really good. So I want us to see what Jesus had to say about the church in Ephesus. All right? Because Jesus commended this church in, in Ephesus. And I want us to really focus on verse 2 and 3 today. All right? Because if you attended this church in Ephesus, all right, you will find that this church was a dynamic church. With a naked eye, you would not see anything wrong with this church. Amen? Because this church was well put together. It was as perfect as it could be. And it was a dynamic church. And everybody wanted to be part of this church. Amen? And Jesus in verse 2, he says, Let's look, if we can go to verse 2 in our Bibles at home, um, Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. And this is what Jesus said. I just want to break this down a little bit for us this morning. Jesus said in verse 2, he says, I know your works. So this was an observation that Jesus Christ made about the service that the church in Ephesus was rendering. This was a growing church, a hustling church. A membership that was dynamic, they were full of energy. They were as busy as bees. They had fully graded choir. Their instrument, if you want to contemporize it, their instrument was state of the art. Their choir was well rolled. Their mission program was excellent, well funded. Their outreach program was excellent. If there's one thing you would say about this church, is that they were, it was a very, very busy church. Whatever this church was, this church was not a lazy church. It was like a giant factory. It was going full steam. Amen. It, it, it was if this church put on a program, that program was going to come out excellent. You know why? Because everybody in that church took part in the program. Everybody was busy doing something about the, 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 the activities of the church. Something was always going on in the church, the Ephesus. So that was their, their works. Jesus says. I know your works. That was an observation that Jesus made about the works. But let's stay on in, in verse 2. Verse 2 also says, I know your labor. Again, an other observation that Jesus Christ made about the labor of the people in Ephesus. Okay. So now, what does the word labor mean there? It talks about their sweat. It was referring to, to the sweat that was involved in the work that they were doing in the church. Because if we look at the differences between the word works and labor, work actually is the service that you render to the church. And the labor is, refers to the sacrifice that you make to the church. So Jesus you know, separated work and labor and he made those observations. And if you like, I would say he gave them 10 out of 10 for that. Amen? So this was a church that was ready to roll up the sleeves. They were ready to put their wheels to the shoulder to work for the Lord. They were spilling their blood and, and sweat. They were toiling, they were in tears. They made sure that they did everything they could to advance the kingdom of God. See, so children of God, it pays to serve Jesus. It pays every day. It pays every step of the way to serve Jesus Christ. 
But I also want to caution you that it also costs to serve Jesus Christ. In the kingdom of God, it says there's no gain, there's no pain. Amen? So if you are going to serve Jesus, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you money. It's going to cost you your effort, your energy. It's going to cost you inconvenience. It's going to cost you your reputation, your popularity. It's going to cost you that. But this church in Ephesus was willing to pay any price to make sure that the work of God was done. And one thing I have learned as a pastor in a growing church is you can grow a church without a lot of things. You can grow a church without a lot of money. You can grow a church without a lot of advertisement. You can grow a church without a big building. A massive choir, lots of programs, of advertising, you can grow a church. But you cannot grow a church without work. And this church in Ephesus spared no cost. They spared no labor. They spared no toil. They did everything they could possibly do to make sure that the work of God advanced. Amen? So that was one observation that Jesus made. So this was a church that was devoted. It was a devoted church. Not only was this church devoted, but Jesus also made an observation about this church. He said that this church in Ephesus was a church that was disciplined. What was a disciplined church? Let's go, let's say in verse 2. Because verse 2 says, it says, could not be at those who were evil. Amen? So in other words, this church was exercising discipline. If any of their members fell into immorality, okay, and would not repent, of the sin, or they have a member who begins to sin in a way that is habitual or wants to bring reproach to the name of Jesus Christ, they only give you one alternative, and that alternative is you either get right or get out, or be good or be gone. That was the alternative they gave to members, but that's a far cry from the church today because in the church, if we find a brother or a sister who is committing sin, who lives in sin. We don't approach the brother or the sister, what we do, we whisper about it. We talk about it. We gossip about it. We don't do anything about it. And in some cases, they'll go to the pastors and elders of the church and say, do you know that that brother is sinning? Why is he doing that? Why are you allowed to do this in church? Why are you allowed to do that in the church? And my question is, but have you spoken to the brother? Oh no, pastor, I haven't spoken. How did you know? Somebody told me. But well, who told you? Oh no, Pastor, I'm not going to read that. I just want you to know. That's not good enough. All right? That's not good. All you're doing is just passing the buck. But you have to approach the brother because you can't ask him, did you approach the brother? If not, why not? Amen? And, and, and that's the problem that the church has today. The problem that the church has today is that we have very little influence over the world. And the world has so much influence over the church. Amen? And, and, but this church in Ephesus had passion for purity. They were determined that, that they were going to stick to the true doctrines. Amen? And, and this was not a church that was judgmental, but they were very biblical because if a brother, a member of that church, you know, backslided, they would want to reprove that brother, they would rebuke that brother, and they would try to restore that brother by exhorting that brother so that they can bring that brother back on the right path with God. Amen? So this was a church that was also disciplined. Not only was this church disciplined, I was telling verse 2, but verse 2 also tells us that this was a discerning church. Amen? And because verse 2 says, you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not. And I found them what? Liars. And that's what Pastor is saying. So this church was not a liberal church. It didn't want anything to do with liberalism at all. They would not encourage a false teacher. They would not encourage heresy in the church. Because they have made up their mind that they were going to stick to the fundamentals of faith. They have made up their mind that they were going to be doctrinally pure. So if they are not, and also to be orthodox. So if a teacher comes in, applying to their seminary school, and they find out that you are a false teacher, they were not going to let you in their seminary school to teach in their seminary school. You're going to be out. Amen? And that's what the church should be today. 
As a matter of fact, Luke actually gave an account of Paul, what Paul said in the book of um, 2 Corinthians, you know, um, 2 Corinthians, uh, no, sorry, the book of Acts, in Acts 20, 20, 22. And this is what, um, uh, this is Luke's account of Paul uh, when he spoke to the church in Ephesus. And he preached Acts 20, 22 to 29. He says, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which has purchased with his blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Children of God, what is good for the church then is good for the church today. It doesn't matter which denomination. But we thank God for this church because they have the courage to identify false teachers and to do something about it. And as a church, if we are not careful, I'm talking about the body of Christ, if we are not careful, we are going to go down the way just as many big churches have. Why? Because of their tolerance and compromising with false teachers. And what has happened to those churches? They've come to their demise. Because why? They compromised. They tolerated, you know, false doctrine. And that is why when a preacher stands and says that it doesn't matter whether Jesus Christ was physically raised from the dead or not, I would say that's false teaching. If a professor stands in a seminary and, and says that single-sex marriage is not sin, it is just a sexual preference, that is false teaching. And if somebody says, you know, a preacher, a professor stands up and says in a seminary that Paul simply was wrong about women, that is false teaching. But then they would say, but hang on a minute. Well, why, 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 why are we not, you know, open-minded? We should be open-minded about what, what's going on in the community. But this is what I say. I say that I am very, very open-minded to the truth. But when I arrived at the truth, on the 28th of October 2005, when I gave my life to Christ, I was practicing initial nationalist Buddhism for 25 years in England. The day I gave my life to Christ, the day I found the truth, I become close-minded. I become close-minded on that day about the word of God. Because I believe that the Bible is infallible. It is inerrant. It is inspired word of God. And I'm not going to change my mind about that. I am close-minded that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, whom God sent, born by the Virgin Mary, who bore our sins, crucified on the cross of Calvary, who died for the redemption of our sins, shed his blood for us. He was resurrected on the third day, and he was seen by people, over 500 people saw Jesus Christ. He ascended into heaven, Again, witnessed by his disciples and angels. Seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding and advocating on our behalf. And he is the soon coming king. Not coming as a baby in a manger, but as a lion of the tribe of Judah that took over his kingdom. You can't change my mind about that. I am not open-minded about that. I am close-minded. Praise God. This church was not only a discerning church, but the Bible also tells us, now we're going to verse 3, the Bible also tells us in verse 3 that this was a determined church. The scripture reads, You have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. So what did that tell us? It tells us that this was a church that would not, was not going to quit. No matter what the trials, no matter what the tribulations are, no matter what the problem, nothing was going to deter this church from doing their duty. And you can tell the greatness of a church by what it takes for them to withstand tribulation. The courage that it takes. And this church was not easily discouraged. But it could have been easily discouraged because, again, remember, this was the, 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 the church was in Ephesus. And Ephesus, you know, the church could have faced all kinds of opposition in that church. Firstly, that church 
Ephesus was a city of culture. Amen? I mean, they had an athletic field. All these athletes came there. They played their games. They had entertainment. They even had a stadium that would host or seat 25,000 people. And people would come there in the daytime to watch the play of the day. You know, so this was, you know, there were all kinds of activities that was going on that could distract the church, all right, or, 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 or divert their attention. Ephesus was also a city of commerce. Because as we know, this was a city that was located right at the sea. And all the ships that came from different parts of the world would come to Ephesus, all right? They would, they, they, they would have, you know, there's a harbor there, and that's where they would dock. And then they would unload all the goods that they brought from all over the world. So Ephesus was also a massive market center, if you like, as the biggest mall, the biggest marketplace in the world then. Again, that was a distraction for the church people. The third thing was, Ephesus was also a city of cults. Because when we talk about the seven ancient wonders of the world, that, that was where the, 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 the temple of, of Artemis was. But also Diana, we all know who Diana was, right? Diana was the Ukrainian goddess. You know, the ancient world, the goddess of lust and sex, right? So in other words, what am I trying to, to, pick, to, to paint here? In other words, this city was just like any major city in the world, like New York, London, Paris. There were a lot of attractions there. But this church never, ever gave up. They didn't even quit because they know that quitters will never win and winners never quit. Amen? So this church was, this is what Paul said about this church in 1 Corinthians 15. This is what he said. He says, this church was steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord, knowing that their labor was not in vain in the Lord. That's what Paul said about this church in Ephesus. Unlike a lot of other churches today, there's a saying that if you can't beat them, join them, right? But the church in Ephesus says, no, we are going to keep beating you until you join us. That was their motto. Amen? So this was a determined church. Praise God. But now, we see that Jesus said that there were flaws in this church. So what could have gone wrong, you ask yourself, with the church? Because this was a, a devoted church. It was a disciplined church. The, the Bible said it was a designing church. It was also what? A determined church. So what went wrong? What really matters as a church is not what other people think about you. All right? Because Jesus saw something. Jesus knew something about this church that most people didn't know or see about this church. All right? Because he said there was a flaw. It was no longer their first love. And that was the flaw. But again, when you look at this church with all the activities they did, what went wrong? How did they miss that? How did they put Jesus second? What happened? Amen? Because as I said, it doesn't really matter what you know, people think about your church. It doesn't matter what the denomination think about your church. It doesn't matter what the newspaper write or think about your church. What really matters is what God knows about your church. Amen? And Jesus knew there was a fatal flaw in their fellowship. They loved Jesus Christ. But they didn't love Jesus like the way they used to love Jesus. They were very busy. They got into the busyness of the church and they neglected Jesus. Praise God. So next week, I'm going to close here. So next week, we're going to look at what remedies this church is going to take in order for Jesus to become their first love. Because sometimes in the church, we get very busy with programs. We get very busy with activities. We get very busy, but we do not, you know, we will really forget about Jesus Christ in the church. So next week, we're going to look at some of the areas that we as a church need to focus on, even as we do all our activities in the church, so that we do not place Jesus Christ second. Amen? Praise God. Let us pray. Our loving and gracious Father, we thank you for your word of God. Father, we heard what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said about the church in Ephesus. He commended them for all their works and their labor. But Jesus said there was a flaw. He became their second love. Father, I pray, O oh God, that as a church, 
we will never ever put Jesus second. I pray, my Lord and my God, that you grant us wisdom of God, that everything that we do in your church of God, that Jesus will come first. That we always sit at the foot of Jesus of God. That we always seek Jesus first in everything that we do, Lord. And we say, Lord, if we have placed you second, we ask the God that he forgive us and have mercy upon us. And grant us the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding of God to always put you first. Because you are the bridegroom of the children. Father, we thank you, Lord. We bless your name. We glorify your name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Who never knows its power. And it's that power that is in the blood of Jesus. That very power that raised our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. From the grave we plead that same blood over every saint. We pray that the blood of Jesus will continue to speak on behalf of the sick. We pray that the blood of Jesus will continue to be a blessing to everyone that says yes Lord we receive you as our Lord and Savior Father we pray the blood of Jesus the power that is in the blood of Jesus of God may prevail in our respective homes this morning may the blood of Jesus of God heal the sick and the hospital because there is sacrificing their lives to attend to patients who have been inflicted by this coronavirus disease. And we just want to say happy Mother's Day to them and may God continue to protect them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen and amen. And so this morning, our message is going to come from the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7 and last week I started off with the church at Ephesus so we're going to complete that today amen and last week just to give an outline last week we, we, we said that the church of uh, no, at Ephesus was a church that was doing everything right but Jesus said that this church had one flaw that he was coming second place in the church Oh, I realize that, um, especially for those who are believers, 
who comes first in our life will determine whether or not your life really counts for God. And that is why Jesus said in the book of Matthew 6, 43, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So again, for us as believers, you know, God comes first. But even though Jesus said that this church had flaws, he also commended the church for what they did. Because when we go to the book of Revelation, I think I spent some time, and uh, Revelation 2, I spent some time in verses 2 and 3, just looking at the commendation that Jesus Christ gave to this church. Now the first thing he said to the church in Ephesus in verse 2 is that I know your works. I know how you serve in the church. I have been watching you. Everything that you do, you do it wholeheartedly. This is what he said, because this church in Ephesus was not a lazy church. It was a church that was very busy. Everybody in that church was busy. There, was, there were things going on and everybody was engaged. And Jesus made that observation and he said, I have seen your works. And he also said in the same verse that I know your labor. Same verse too. And again, Jesus knew the sacrifice that this church was making. Because there's a distinction between your work and your labor. Your work is your service in the church. Your labor is the sacrifice that you make in the church. And Jesus commended this church. He also said about this church that it was a church with a discerning spirit. In verse 2. He said, you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found liars. Again, this was a church that kept to the fundamentals of their faith. They were not going to, 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 to compromise that they decided to, to go to, 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 to follow you know, you know, pure doctrine. They didn't compromise at all. And Jesus also said about this church that this church was a determined church. Because when you look at the city of Ephesus, there were so many things. I mean, the culture of that, of, of that city. You know, they, they had a big theater, sitting over 25,000 people. They, 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 there were games, there were shows. There were so many distractions in the city of Ephesus. It was a city of commerce where all these ships would come and they would dock and display their goods. It was the biggest mall in the world at that time. It was also a city of cults. If we talk about the seven wonders of the world, that was where the temple of, of Amethyst was. And we all know the goddess Diana who was the goddess of lust and sex. So again, Ephesus, like any other city, like Milan, London, Paris, New York, there was huge distraction. But Jesus noted that these people were not distracted. These two, they, they were steadfast. And even Paul made a comment about that in the book of 1 Corinthians 15, 18. He said, this church was steadfast and movable, always abounding in the works of the Lord, knowing that their labor was not in vain in the Lord. So unlike other churches, this church was determined. Because there's a saying that if you cannot beat them, join them. But the church in Ephesus says, no, we are not joining you. We are going to continue beating you. Because they were never going to give up. But then when we get to verse 5, we see that there was a criticism about this church. This church was, it was a determined church. It was a devoted church. So what happened? Now we ask the question, why? What could have gone wrong in the church in Ephesus? After all, it was a devoted church. It was a disciplined church. It was a discerning church. It was a determined church. It was a dynamic church. If you want to, you know, just look in the totality of it, it was a determined church. So what in the world could Jesus find wrong with this church in Ephesus? Well, Jesus knew something or saw something in that church that the naked eye couldn't see. Because you know what really matters? It doesn't really matter what other people say about your church. It doesn't really matter what the newspaper writes about your church or says about your church. It doesn't matter what the denomination says about your church. What matters it is what God knows about your church. And Jesus knew that they had a fatal flaw in their fellowship. They loved Jesus. But they didn't love Jesus the way they used to love Jesus Christ. They had left their first love. Their spiritual honeymoon with Jesus Christ was over. So now, you ask the question, what went wrong? Is it this church 
had a problem. But before I talk about that problem, before I go into details, you know, I said that they had lost their first love for Jesus. That their honeymoon was over. Their spiritual honeymoon with Jesus was over. And I just want us to bring this home for those of us who are married. In the first days of your relationship, you know, with your new bride. Do you remember, you know, what the honeymoon was like? You, you never took your eyes off your bride. For the newly wedded, the husband will always open the door, the car door for his wife, and make sure that the two legs are in the car, that the dress was not hanging out, put the dress in, and then gently shut the door. But you know, honeymoon doesn't last forever. Somebody once says that if a man does that, it's one of two things. Either the guy is new or the wife is new. So, but as time goes on, as weeks, months, and years goes on, she begins to take a second place. Why? Why is she taking a second place? And that's what is happening in the church with us Christians today. Our spiritual honeymoon with Jesus Christ is over. Our love for Jesus has grown stale. And that was a problem with the church in Ephesus. They were so busy doing things that they didn't have time to spend with Jesus Christ. They had programs all over the place. One program after another. Very successful programs. But guess what? They had so many programs that they didn't have any passion for Jesus Christ. They were busy for the Lord, but they were not a blessing to the Lord. And I'm sure we all remember the story of Martha and Mary in the book of Luke, chapter 10. You know, Martha was always very busy in the kitchen, cooking, chopping onions, making sure that everything was okay, peeling the, 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 the potatoes, while, Jesus, while Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, worshipping Jesus. Listening to the sermon that Jesus was preaching. In fact, Martha got so, Martha got so incensed in verse 40. This is what it says in uh, um, Luke 10, 40. But Martha, Martha was distracted with serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. And this was Jesus' response in verses 41 and 42. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. When somebody calls you twice with a tone, it means calm down, calm down. You are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. You see, when a church comes to the point that what is more important than worship, and labor is more important than love, then Jesus has taken second place in that church. Do you know that there are some people who love their Sunday school class more than they love Jesus Christ? Um, choir, let me, let me talk to the choir wherever you are in your various homes. Do you know that there are some people who will sing for Jesus Christ, they love singing for Jesus, but they don't love the Jesus for whom they sing? There are people who just you know, come to church, they love the church, they love the money of the church, but they do not love Jesus Christ. There are those who come to church because they love the edifice, the beauty, the elegance of the church, but they do not love Jesus Christ. We hear people say, well, we'll go to that church, it's a big church. That the children's ministry is perfect, the choir is perfect, that the youth ministry is perfect, everything is perfect. So because of that, we are going to that church. So you love the church, you love the programs, you love everything they do in the church. But my question is, do you love Jesus? You see, the members of the church in Ephesus were all doing the right things. But they were doing them for the wrong reasons. They were obedient, but their heart was not in what they were doing. They were orthodox. They were straight as a gun barrel, but they were empty. Because why? They didn't love Jesus. See, so when we go to the book of Mark chapter 12, verse 13, somebody asked Jesus a trick question because we know in the, 
you know, in the Old Testament, there were so many laws which was then dwindled down to the Ten Commandments. All right? And Jesus was talking to his people, and one of them asked this tricky question, trying to catch Jesus. He says, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment of all? All right? And this was Jesus' response in Mark 12, 30. Jesus said, it is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So when you give God your ability, you haven't given God anything because God is able to do everything. He said, when you give God your intelligence, you haven't given God anything at all because why? God knows it all. If you give God your money, you haven't given God anything because why? He owns everything. But when you give God your love, then you have put God in his rightful place. Amen? Amen. Do you know why the first commandment is not to work for God? It is not to pray to God. It's not to give to God. It's not to witness for God. Because when you love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, then you will work for God. Then you will serve God. Then you will give to God. And then you will witness to God. So there was a famous missionary by the name of Hudson Taylor. I'm sure most of you have heard of him. He was asked a question. Somebody asked Hudson Taylor a question and said, Mr. Taylor, do you think that the greatest requirement for a missionary is for that missionary to love the lost souls. Hassan Taylor thought about that question for a second. And he said, no, no. The greatest commandment or the greatest requirement for a missionary is to love the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if the missionary loves Jesus, they would love the lost soul. Amen? So there's one thing you can do that no one else can never do and that is to love Jesus Christ. Just you, the individual. You can do that. Nobody can do it. You know, there are people in the church who can sing better than you. There are people in the church who can preach better than you, who can teach better than you. But nobody can love Jesus better than the way you love Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. I tell you, if you want a Christian to do something in the church, get that Christian to love Jesus. Because when a Christian loves Jesus Christ, that Christian can do anything for Jesus. You know, there are people in the church who have been given spiritual gifts. The gifts of teaching. And you ought to be teaching Sunday school in the church. You have the ability, but you think that you don't do it because you haven't got the time. I, I submit to you that that is not the reason why you don't do it. You don't do it because you don't love Jesus like you ought to love Jesus. Mm. There are people sitting around in the church who God has given a gift who are sitting there who should be singing in the church for the glory of God. You've been given a beautiful voice and you could make such a tremendous contribution to the kingdom and to the glory of God by singing his glorious praises. And the reason why you don't do that is because you say, I don't have time to come to church. I don't have time to come to the choir practice. No, I submit. It is not the reason why. The reason why is because you do not love Jesus the way you ought to love him. And let's be honest with ourselves. And let's be honest with God. The reason why many, people, many of us do not win souls like we ought to win souls. The reason why many of us do not share our faith the reason why many of us do not tell people about the death, the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ it's not because we don't know what to say. It's not because we're embarrassed. No. It's simply because we do not love Jesus Christ the way we ought to love Jesus. Amen. You know, when I was preparing this, I just looked at the way that Jesus handled this whole situation with the church in Ephesus. And then the first thing that he did was to identify the problem. He said, there's a flaw here. And that flaw is that you've put me in second place. But then he went on, you know, to commend them also. Commended them for what they were doing. You know? And then after commending them, he reinstated. He reinstated the problem. Now, I've come second place. You don't love me the way you used to love me. 
And then Jesus proceeded to cancel the church. He came up with prescription about how they can correct that. And then at the end, he had the last word. But if you do not follow my counsel, there are actions I'm going to take. You see, children of God, let me just, let me just because that, he had a minister to me. He says, the Bible will state the problem, but the Bible also has the solution to that problem. And if you don't follow the instruction, if you don't follow what the Bible is telling you how to solve that problem, don't blame the devil, blame yourself. Because you didn't follow simple instructions. And that's what happened here in the church in Ephesus. He said, if you do not heed my counsel, there is something I'm going to do. So let's look at the counsel. Let's look at what Jesus said to this church. So now, what is a church or a Christian to do? That is, if we are honest enough with ourselves to admit that Jesus Christ has fallen into second place in our lives. Because first and foremost, we've got to confess. We've got to admit. We've got to accept that, yes, Jesus Christ is taking second place in our life. But Jesus Christ gave us some practical advice on how to restore the first love. Amen? Amen. And there are some things that we need to do in order to rekindle that fire. But there's one thing Jesus will also do if we do not rekindle that fire and put him in his rightful place, which is first. So let's go to verse 5 of Revelation chapter 2, verse 5. And it's, the, the, the Bible says, Remember therefore from where you have fallen. So look at that word, remember. So the first thing that Jesus said you have to do is to go back. Retract. If you lose something and you're going to look for something, you're going to follow, you're going to you know, backtrack, right? Where was I? Was I in that room? You go back and you start searching. So Jesus said, remember from where you have fallen, all right? So if you're trying to find something that said, you go back to where you were in order to find that lost thing. Then think back to the point in your life when you were most on fire for Jesus. Think back about that time. When you are most on fire for Jesus, is that fire in your heart just as hot now as it was then? Or is that fire beginning to, to flicker out? Do you remember how it was when you were first truly saved? You were eager for Jesus. You come to church on time. You serve diligently. You, go, you attended Bible study. You attended prayer meetings. You did everything. You studied the word of God. You are sitting at the feet of Jesus Christ. Are you still doing that? Do you remember how it was when you first married your new bride? How sweet and how hot and how special your love was for your bride? It ought to be just as it was now as it was then. Amen? And it should even be sweeter. Hallelujah. So for married couples, go home today. Rekindle your romance with your wife. Amen? But the focus is on Jesus. That was just a side track. Okay? But remember, think back when you love Jesus the most. When you say, well, what good is that going to do, Pastor? I'm a, what, what good would I do? I used to love Jesus. I don't anymore. I don't know what to do. All right? I remember how I used to love Jesus. Now, how can I love him like I used to love him? Maybe there's somebody out there who has lost their first love for Jesus Christ. But you don't know what to do about it. You don't know how to rekindle that love for Jesus. I want you to listen to what Jesus says. Jesus says, the first thing he said was to remember, but then he comes back to say, in the same verse 5, Jesus said, repent. Repent. When you don't love somebody the way you ought to love that person, it is not that that feeling is completely lost. There is something that can be done about it. Ask yourself this question. Has there ever been a time in your life when you are more excited about Jesus Christ than you are at this moment? Has there ever been a time when you are more in love with Jesus Christ than you are right now? 
If your answer to those questions is yes, you are a backslider. And you need to repent. Hallelujah. You see, to love the Lord your God is a commandment. It is a commandment. Because the Bible is a commandment in the Bible is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Okay? Then the greater sin, if that is the greatest commandment, then the greater sin is to fail to love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength. And one thing every Christian can do about sin is to repent. Amen? Amen. You can turn away from your sin. And you can begin to do things that you should do in order to begin to, to rekindle your relationship with Jesus Christ. Or you can, you know, you, you, or the other thing you can do is to quit doing what you are doing. Now. Those distractions in your, in your life, just turn away from them. Just in those things and begin to focus on Jesus Christ. And if your love for Jesus has only been prominent, it can once again become preeminent in your life. You can this moment put Jesus on the throne of your castle. You can crown him once again as the king of your life. You can put him back in the only place that he belongs. In the rightful place that he deserves. And that is for the first place. Chain of God, listen to me, I'm coming to a close. Whatever it is that is keeping you from loving Jesus like you ought to love Jesus can be put behind you and away from you. And you can turn away from it and ignore it and ask God for forgiveness. Get forgiveness for it. And commit your life totally to Christ. And let him through the power of the Holy Ghost rekindle the fire of the love in your heart for Jesus Christ. And the other thing that Jesus said we can do, he said, remember, repent. Now he says, repeat. After we remember and repent, we have to repeat. It's in verse 5. Let's go to verse 5 again. Verse 5 says, and do the first works. It means repeat it, right? And do the first works. Because you're not doing the first work anymore. So if you have to do it, it means to repeat what you were doing before. All right. So Jesus says, go back to the first work. Do you know what the first work is? Of this church, Manzara Fellowship Church? May I say what it is not? The first work is not to witness. Your first work is not to pray. Your first work in the church is not to preach. Your first work in the church is not to fellowship. Your first work in the church is to love Jesus Christ. I'm convinced that most of the problems in the church has ultimately resulted because of the result of not loving Jesus Christ as we ought to love him. And I'm also convinced that the solution to any problem in the church we ever face is simply to love Jesus like Jesus ought to be loved. So now remember, we have to what? Remember, we have to repent and we have to repeat. But Jesus also said something in verse 5. You see, this is where he had the last word. Because he's giving us all these prescriptions. And Jesus said, if you don't do this, this is what I'm going to do. All right? He said, remove. Now Jesus gives us this prescription, no? Of how to restore him back to his rightful place. But if you refuse to do that, the last word is remove. For Jesus says, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. What will he do? Remove your lampstand. Now, why is a lampstand taken down? Why would you take down a lampstand? The only time you take out a lampstand, the only reason why you remove a lampstand, there's only one reason. It's because the light has gone out. It's useless. Because what a lampstand does is to carry the light. So when love 
goes out of the church, the light goes out of the church. And that's when people say to me, Pastor Man, this person leaves the church, the church is going to go. Uh, when this person, oh, this person, no, 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 no. When the Holy Spirit leaves the church, I don't care who is in the church, the light is out. Doesn't matter who is there. He said, the light of the church is Jesus. But what fear is that light? What well, fear that light is our love for Jesus Christ. That is the fear for that light. So a loveless church is a lifeless church. And a lifeless church is a lifeless church. Amen? A home without love is just a house. A church without love is just a building. A, a, a Christian without love is a sounding what? It's a sounding brass. And what? And a tingling symbol. That's what it is. And do you know what happened? I don't know whether we can show that slide I sent to the medium. We cannot show it. I was going to show you a slide of what Ephesus looks like today. Because back in the 6th century, the church of Ephesus had totally disappeared. Today, that city lies in ruins. I, I, I wish we could have shown that. That city lies in ruins. Unhabited. Christ removed their lampstand and the light went out. That was what happened. They did all the wonderful things. They served. You know, they, they sacrificed. They did everything. But they refused to put Jesus first. And they said, you know what? I will remove my lampstand. So my question to you is, have you left the first love? If you don't love Jesus like you ought to love Jesus, if Jesus doesn't have a place in your life, you face one of two choices. It's either revival or removal. Amen? Amen. And I wonder if Jesus came to Mount Zion Fellowship Church today, would he let our lampstand remain? Or would he remove our lampstand? I want us to know, I want this church to be known, if not for anything else, even if we don't do things right, even if things do not go right, even if things do not sound right, but we put Jesus Christ first. That is his place in the church. It doesn't matter whether the media didn't work right today, it doesn't matter whether the choir didn't sing fine. Those things I don't lose sleep over. But are we putting Jesus first? Are we putting our programs first? Are we looking for excellence? Because we want everything to be perfect. And in the midst of all of that business, so busy like Martha, and we forget Jesus Christ. May we never let Jesus come in second place in our Zion Fellowship Church. Because if we do, we will come last. Let us pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. Father, you have spoken to us. You have given us a prescription of God. But first and foremost, we come and ask for forgiveness, Lord. If we've ever put you in a second place, we ask that you forgive us, God. Have mercy upon us. And we thank you, O God, for your prescription on how we can put you back in your rightful place. And I pray, O God, as I say, church, whatever we do, we do passionately for you. Don't be seated at your feet at all times, O God. Listening to your preaching, worshiping you, O God. Not man, not the edifice, no matter how beautiful it is. But we know that you will always come first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.